Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In one of our last episodes, we took a look at the venerable Y-Wing, the workhorse assault fighter for three generations of democracy-loving factions in Star Wars. In today's episode, we're going to revisit the equally as important starfighter known as the A-Wing Interceptor. The Y-Wing was created by Coensayer, a starship components manufacturing company that rarely designed starfighters, which meant that the Y-Wing was something that was designed from scratch without no pre-existing models. The A-Wing, on the other hand, was designed by Quant Systems Engineering, one of the largest and oldest shipyards in the galaxy. Through their main orbital shipyard over Quant and their hundreds of subsidiaries, both public and secret, they controlled a massive portion of the shipbuilding market, which meant that not only were their ships top of the line and made from the best materials backed by the best research, they usually also had a long lineage as well. And so to get to the A-Wing, we have to start way before the first A-Wing was drawn on some designer's data pad. We have to go back to the golden age of the Republic before the Clone Wars even started. And you guys all probably know by now the drill. The Galactic Republic had been demilitarized for almost a thousand years, and so manufacturers of warships had shifted focus to creating more civilian products. Demand for military ships basically came from two different type of customers. You had your local defense forces, which usually were looking for snub fighters, frigates, corvettes, and maybe one or two cruisers. You did have larger core world defense fleets, which would have been more robust and filled out with ships of the line, more commonly seen during the old Republic age. But for the most part, the galaxy's military readiness had been at its lowest point in a long time, which meant that Commander Shepard could have done a better job when going through the single player campaign. The other customer would have been the Republic's Judicial Department. This was sort of like the Galactic Republic's version of the FBI or the Coast Guard. The Judicials focused on settling disputes, tracking down interstellar criminals, and also protecting the hyperspace lanes from pirates and bandits. When larger conflicts arose, the Judicials would call upon the help of nearby local defense forces to combat enemy fleets. Because the Judicials were a peacekeeping force, their ships usually didn't have the best offensive capabilities, but they were usually quite well defended and quite fast. The Jedi Order were coordinated within the Judicials, and they were provided with Republic starships for their missions. The Jedi, of course, had special abilities and also special needs. In the past, they might have used civilian ships or military ships designed for ordinary pilots, but now for the first time, the Republic wanted to create custom ships just for the Jedi and their special talents. Their role as peacekeepers and diplomats continued to grow as the underfunded and understaffed judicial department struggled to keep the peace, especially in the Outer Rim. The Republic contracted Quat Drive Yards for the project, and well explicit, a starship engineer who would become one of the most talented and prolific ship designers in the galaxy would be assigned to the job. Wellex was a huge fan of the sleek looking art class tactical strike fighters used by the Old Republic thousands of years ago. The nine meter long fighters had S foils that opened up like a butterfly knife and were known as A wings at the time. The Arc fighter and its many variants served the Republic for a ridiculously long time. They were used as early as 4,000 years before the Battle of Yavin during the Mandalorian Wars and were still seen during the New Sith Wars up till the Rusan Reformation. 3,000 years later. It would be like seeing an Egyptian war chariot on our own modern battlefield today. Blissick really liked how minimalistic and small the Oryx body frame was. It was almost comparable in size to a droid fighter and would have looked tiny next to a more traditional snub fighter of that period. Droid fighters had a lot of advantages. They didn't have cockpits, inertial compensators, or life support systems, and they usually didn't need as much armor. This allowed their design to be extremely small, presenting a tiny profile for enemies chasing them, and it also allowed them to be extremely nimble. The Jedi were kind of similar to droid pilots. They did need cockpits, but they didn't need extra sensors and a lot of these other flight aids that a normal pilot would need. And this was because they had the Force. Some Jedi were even able to make hyperspace jumps using their own special power. And so the Delta VII Aether Sprite class light interceptor was born. At just eight meters long, the Delta VII was built around two massive thrusters and little else. There was a very light deflector shield, dual lasers, no hyperdrive, the ship relied on booster rings, and no heavier munitions. What resulted was a ship that could outclass any other ship at sublight speeds and was also extremely maneuverable and was extremely difficult for anyone to pilot. You either had to have force powers or be a weird alien with fast reflexes. A Doug might have been able to do it. The controls were said to be so responsive, even at slow speed, that a Jedi could never get their starship ballet parked. 
While the ship was terrific for the Jedi on their diplomatic or anti-criminal missions, the beginning of the Clone Wars exposed a major flaw in the ship's design. The Delta VII was ridiculously thin. It was so thin that a full astromech couldn't even be docked onto the ship. You could only fit the head of an astromech. This also meant you could forget about any substantial armor. Then there were the shields, which were kind of useless against military-grade lasers. The Jedi could easily outmaneuver a single fighter in a dogfight and avoid its fire, but in a larger space battle, debris and stray laser bolts were much harder to avoid. What the Jedi really needed was a ship that could survive the rigors of a massive dogfight. Flying a Delta VII into battle was like driving a Corvette onto a modern battlefield. It just wasn't the right tool for the job. And as Jedi pilot casualties started adding up in the beginning of the war, a lot of Jedi started protesting for a new ship. The Delta VII-B was created with a slightly thicker hull, allowing full astromechs to dock on, but still the ship was quite vulnerable to stray enemy fire. Although some Jedi, like Master Plo Clune, would continue flying the Delta VII until his unfortunate friendly fire incident. Now, boys and girls, it might look cool to have your IFF tag switched off, but there's nothing cool about being dead. The ETA-2 Actus, also designed by Quant Systems Engineering, served as a replacement for the Delta VII. It featured S-foils and a shorter fuselage, heavier weapons, and overall was more advanced. Oddly enough, the first version of the ETA Actus had no shields at all, which meant it caused even more protests from within the Jedi Order. I'm actually pretty convinced that this was all Palpatine's plan to put the Jedi in very fragile ships, increasing their casualties. It's definitely something he would do, and this is why I'm really happy he's coming back. The ETA Actus would go on to inspire the Senior Fleet System's TIE Fighter line, while the Delta VII quietly faded away. Well, it didn't completely fade away, it was still a remarkable ship, and Quad Systems Engineering saw some more potential in the design. Despite the mysterious disappearance of the Jedi, they still saw promise in an extremely fast and lightly armed interceptor. This would lead to the R-22 Spearhead prototype, which was supposed to improve on a lot of the Delta VII's shortcomings. Unfortunately, the Empire shut down that program before they could go into mass production. The prototypes that were left were eventually purchased by the monarch of Tammuz An, a small world on the border of Hut Space. From a design standpoint, the R-22s were said to have tested the limits of maneuverability and speed. Decades later, the Rebel Alliance were looking for a starship that was suitable for their little organization, and they ran into the R-22s. Rebel engineers swapped out some of the original engines for a pair of more modern Novaldex J-77s, and updated all the sensors, computers, and weapons aboard, and the RZ-1 A-Wing interceptor was born. Even shorter than the Delta 7 b the A-Wing was only 6.9 meters long and was an engineering marvel. The scientists at Quant Systems Engineering had somehow managed to fit a Class I hyperdrive inside the ship along with concussion missiles, shields, armor plating, and a lot of other things. And still, it was faster than any other mass-produced ship at sublight speeds. The inclusion of hyperdrive and heavier missions was especially important for a ragtag group like the Rebellion, who could only strike from the shadows and would be completely destroyed in a prolonged fight. Now, at its core, the RZ-1A still took the Delta 7 bs philosophy of taking two gigantic engines and then strapping a pilot to it. And this time around, it was at least a little bit more maneuverable and manageable for a non-force user. But to be an A-Wing interceptor pilot, one usually had to prove themselves on the more stable T-65 X-Wing platform. The A-Wing was definitely a lot tougher than the Delta 7B, but it still couldn't take much damage, but its speed more than made up for it. As the war continued, the Empire desperately scrambled to develop a Starfighter that could counter the A-Wing's unique abilities. The TIE Interceptor was the result, but it still lacked the same straight-line sublight speed that the A-Wing was famous for. As the war continued and the Empire gradually replaced the basic TIE in-space superiority fighter with more advanced models, Rebel pilots began modifying, or more like stripping down, their A-wings, removing heavy weapons, shields, and even armor to increase their speed. It was one of these modified A-wings piloted by Green Leader Avril Crinid, which crashed through the bridge of the Executor, causing the Super Star Destroyer to crash into the second Death Star, which probably makes it one of the most cost-efficient kills in galactic history. Towards the end of the Galactic Civil War, the RZ-2A was designed and manufactured. It was kind of based off of the R-22 prototype and also the RZ-1A. What resulted was an interceptor with a slightly longer fuselage and several of the modifications Rebel mechanics had made to the RZ-1 during the Galactic Civil War. The RZ-2 was even faster than the RZ-1, and one of the interesting additions made to the ship was a pair of Zija Go-4 laser cannons attached on swiveling cannon mounts on the wings. This allowed the A-Wing to strafe targets for a longer period of time, and it also allowed the pilots to fire off board. That meant even firing behind them when they're getting chased. 
The RZ-2 A-Wing also was far more reliable than the Rebel version of the Interceptor, which oftentimes spent as much time in the repair bay as on the battlefield. I'm really glad we're going to be able to see the A-Wing in action again uh, for the resistance against the First Order. It's going to be a really important part of their slash and run uh, attack mentality. Anyway guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.